the genocide of the native peoples, uh, the attempt to wipe them out, to destroy them, to massacre them. Some of the earliest presidents had their reputations, uh, much uh, to uh, the chagrin of history, as being Indian fighters. That was what they called Andrew Jackson, the Indian fighter. Uh, the second birth defect was the enslavement of African people, a people whose history goes back to the very dawn of humanity, a people whose nobility is written in all of the material artifacts that you find on the African continent, a people who have challenged and continue to challenge the inhumanity of Eurocentric attitudes. This has been our history, to live in a society in which we are the ones who have pushed the frontiers of justice. We have pushed the frontiers of freedom. When you talk about freedom in the American society, you can't talk about it without talking about black people. It's the African people in this country who made the term freedom meaningful. In fact, you can't even talk about it in an abstract sense without talking about black people because you know the Declaration of Independence doesn't talk about it. You know in the Constitution, the only thing they talk about is a free speech and freedom of religion. But they don't talk about what black people were always talking about, and that is being free from oppression. So we are fundamentally the ones who have interpreted the notion of freedom because we were very early on in this country uh, enslaved and in bondage. And the bondage itself made it necessary for us to always teach our children to be free and to have the notion of freedom and to work toward freedom. That's been our task. So, I wanted to talk a few minutes today about the renaissance of African people. That is, we have faced these challenges and we see that on every corner of our contemporary history, we have met challenges, we have faced those challenges, but we have also been a persistent people. And I just want to talk about how some of those things have occurred because I want you to understand that we have not yet finished the battle, but we will gain the victory. That is the truth of the African people. Let me, and I, I, I don't stand here saying that as an empty thought. I, I stand here saying that because I know the shoulders upon which I stand. And others have said it. It was um, incredible for me to read our history and to write our history. Uh, the most important thing, and I guess in my own career, has been to write the book, The History of Africa. Because in writing the book, The History of Africa, it taught me a lot that I did not know. In writing the book, uh, The History of the African American People, it taught me a lot I did not know. And so now I know so much about it, I, am, I feel full and I feel confident that we are on the right road for our renaissance. They say renaissance means rebirth. It means a resurgence. And I think that we have to start talking in a resurgent way. Let me just tell you though, that the difficulty is that we are not the same as we were in the past. We were, I think, in the past, a little clearer in our ideology about who we were and what we want to do and be, and what we wanted this nation to do and be, and what we wanted Africa as a continent to do and be. But somewhere along the line, we got confused. Confusion came in. And when the confusion came in, many of our people that we thought were clear became unclear. And the, and the, and the lack of clarity has also uh, actually come to us so that we
we no longer talk like we used to talk. Let me give you an illustration of what I mean. You know, I don't know whether you ever heard of Alan West, yeah. um, Ward Connor, or um, they, 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 they have these people all, they're coming up in all different ways. And not just Clarence Thomas. You, you have all kinds of people, right? Now, in the, right, in the past, think about what we used to do in the past. In the past, we would say you were Uncle Tom. Now, we don't talk like that. We assume that it's normal for black people to be against themselves. It's not, it's just their opinion. They have an opinion that's just different from your opinion. They don't like black people, and you ought not to call them names because they don't like black people. I didn't know anybody. They are, if, if they got PhDs, they are Dr. Toms. If, if, they, if they have law degrees, they are attorney Toms. You, we have we have tongues and the, and the tongue character in our society. That character itself is an abiding character that runs straight right along against other African people who have been clear in their attitudes and their minds about their identity. We've always had people who have been on the on the clear side. They could see. America for what it is and what it should be. We've had those people. And I want to tell you, quite frankly, that when you read the history and you read somebody like Anna Julia Cooper or Mariah Stewart, particularly when Anna Julia Cooper says, where and when I enter, my people enter with me. I always find that to be a powerful statement. Because whenever uh, I enter a place, whenever I go to a university, whenever I speak at a church or a mosque, wherever I am, whenever I am in uh, conferences with uh, people from other uh, cultures and nations, I always say, my people enter with me. I don't go there alone. This is my like not coming here today. I don't come in here alone. I stand with Marcus Garvey. I, I, I come in here and I stand with Sheikh Anta Joe. I don't, I don't come in here just to talk to you. I don't, I'm not just give, I mean, in a sense of giving you my opinion. The opinion that I give you when I'm talking with you is based on substance. John Henry Clark is with you. Dr. Robinson is with you. You see. Anna Julia Cooper is with me, but so is Mary McLeod Bethune. What she willed to us and her last will and testament. So I stand with strong characters, you see? And it's out of that strength that I'm able to talk about Renaissance, about how do we change ourselves and how do we change our condition. Because our condition is not permanent. No condition is permanent. Let me tell you something. We we were enslaved for 200 and 46 years in this country. That's just in this country. In Brazil, they were enslaved longer. We were enslaved for 246 years. We have just been free for about 146. We were enslaved longer than we have been free. And so since we have been free from slavery, as long as we were enslaved, we still have a ways to go to change some of the habits that we think are inherent. But remember something. When slavery ended in this country in 1865, we never had a therapy session. Nobody ever got us together and said, let's process what happened to y'all. You've been taken from your own homeland, where you spoke your own language for thousands of years. You've been taken from your own homeland, where your mothers and fathers created civilizations, understood what good cooking and food was like. They had also developed ways to deal with metals 
and for 246 years you were separated from your African heritage. So you need therapy. They didn't tell us that. They didn't tell us. We walked around and said our names were John and Bob and Richard because we didn't even know our names. They had taken our names away from us. Can you imagine that? Our, our, the names that we had, the, the names that our ancestors had, that they, the attempt was to destroy us to the point that the names of our ancestors would no longer be heard. It was a genocide of culture. It was cultural side. Get rid of not just black people, but get rid of the memory. John Henry Clark, the noble warrior of Harlem, used to say that when the white man colonized the world, he didn't just colonize land, he colonized information about that land. So that even the information we had about our own history and culture, that information was so colonized that we couldn't use it. Some of it they would give to us. And that information, when we got it, we read the information and said, wait a minute, this is against black people. We can't have this kind of information. They're telling us that we never wore clothes. They're telling us that we didn't have languages. We only had dialects. They're telling us that we didn't have kingdoms and empires. That we were too disorganized to have that. They're telling us that we never had scholars and intellectuals. That our man Baba was nothing but a fiction. Nothing but a, something in our imagination but was not real. They're telling us that our uh, people uh, were not the first humans on the earth. In fact, we were not just the first humans, but before 70,000 years ago, everybody in the world was black. So, so not only were we the first, everybody was black before 70,000 years ago. So, the, so, so we lived longer in Africa. The human race lived longer in Africa than it has lived outside of Africa. In fact, it was, and we lived three-fourths of the time of Homo sapiens was in Africa. Only a fourth of the time is outside of the continent of Africa. And yet, I'm telling tell you about this renaissance, yet, the problem is that our children have been so distorted by the educational system that, our, that when they talk about our children, it almost brings tears to my eyes because I understand precisely what has happened to us, a lot of our children. Our children sit in those classrooms, but they know they are outside of the text. They know that they are outside of the thinking of the teachers. And so consequently, they are outside of the classroom, even though they're sitting right in there. That, that is the attitude. Because what has happened is a distortion of their history. We, our children are very smart. Herbert Cole said it one time. He said, very few black children fail school. If anything, schools fail them. But, but, but very few fail school. Well, it, in order to fail something, you have to try something. And they don't try because they recognize what it is. And the ones who do try and pass and do well, we are proud of them, but we know the hurt and the brutality that they have often experienced in order to do it. They're the ones who have to fight for their aids and excellences. They're the ones that others want to keep down and put down, but yet because of their will and perseverance and the history of their culture and the power of their thinking, they fight on. But let me tell you something, and this is part of what we're doing with the Malefic Ketia Asante Institute. That institute is located at 5535 Germantown Avenue, and we have uh, lectures, classes, seminars uh, at the institute. 
you can get those seminars and you can get those classes from the institute. But let me just tell you what, what is so important about it. If you look at, and you can just look it up, the Lefty Santa Institute, you can Google it, and you can find out how to register for classes, take classes, and so on. But the idea behind it was that we needed a think tank. You know how many think tanks are in America? 4,000. You know how many black think tanks there are that's serious? Zero. Now, let me tell you something. We, we have think tanks. We do have, we have a couple calling themselves think tanks, but they're not real think tanks. And, and, and we also have a think tank at Howard University, government sponsored, the Joint Center. The Joint Center, the Joint Center at Howard is a think tank. It's a serious think tank, but it is, it is funded by the U.S. government. We created in Philadelphia an independent, privately funded African think tank that will deal with issues that are domestic and international. That is really unusual in the black world. We, we don't have yet the money they have in the Brookings Institute or in the Heritage Foundation or the Manhattan Institute and all these conservative think tanks that they have. But what think tanks do, more importantly than universities, think tanks set the agenda for this society. And you, and you won't know that unless, if you read the New York Times, they will tell you, such and such a person, a fella at the Brookings Institute. They, when they say that they tell you, then that tells you something. What that means is that a whole lot of white folks gave a whole lot of money to create an agenda for this society. That, those are the agendas, that are, those are the competing agendas. Our, our renaissance comes when we have the kind of Afrocentric consciousness that will allow us to think of ourselves as creators, to think of ourselves as agents capable of changing the agenda of, of not only the society, but internationally. That's important. We have that capability, but you must take it. You know, I'm, I'm not going to be long, but I want to just tell you this. You know, Hegel, Hegel was the name Hegel, H-E-G-E-L, is the greatest name in European scholarship. He is, well, probably next to Plato. He's considered the most powerful European intellectual. In 1828, Hegel said this about black people. He said, we are outside, they are outside of history. We are no part of history. We have no, because black people have no historical consciousness. It took me a long time to try to understand what he meant by that. But I think I finally understood it. You know, to have a sense of history, and to have a sense of place, and a sense of agency, is at the core of any renaissance. We can't change anything unless we believe we can. We can't change anything unless we have a sense that this way I make history for posterity. I'm not just doing it for myself in my own time. I'm doing it for the future. That's what you have to do. And if you do that, if you put that in your family, in your community, if you put that in the sense of your own future, you will create a new world. People will look at you and say, wow, look what those people have done. That's because you have a sense of history. You see? This is what, so Hegel said, black people, we, we didn't have that. And I'm saying we do have it. I'm saying we've always had it. It may not have been well developed, and I'm hoping that we will have it, the uh, sense to develop it now and to create this sense of will, determination, that we can do what we want to. Samuel Huntington, the white political scientist who was the hero of Ronald Reagan and the Bush family, uh, wrote a book that was called The Clash of Civilizations. And in his book, The Clash of Civilizations, Huntington said that white people uh, or the Western world had to 
control all of the crucial and critical resources of the world. That they had to control the water, the sea. They had to control space. They had to control nuclear energy. They had to control petroleum. And they had to control uh, information technology. That, that, that if the white people wanted to continue to dominate the world, they had to control those things. And they cannot stand any challenge from anybody on those things. Those are fundamental to controlling the universe. Well, interesting thing by Huntington's statement is that he also said this. He said, you know, and this is in the book. Go get the book, The Clash of Civilizations. It's a conservative document about how white people can continue to control the world. Many things are in there. But the, the other the thing that I want to say is that he said, now, in order to, to, to do this, we have to also continue to be united. That in our societies, in Western societies, where you have a multiplicity of cultures, where you have a multiplicity of religions, where you have multi-ethnic populations, it is very difficult to continue to have a united nation and a united society. He said, in the United States, we cannot allow African-American people to have one agenda that's different from the agenda of white people. Can't do that. You gotta have the same agenda. And you have to work to have the same agenda. Read, read Huntington, he's very clear. You have, to, you have to get rid of all of the agendas that threaten the domination of Europe in the society. And then he said this. He said, we do not control the world because we are the most intelligent. We do not control the world because we are the wisest. He said, we only have been able to control the world because we are the ones most willing to you. You got it. We are the ones most willing to use force to make our will happen. And it's a scary thing. It's a thought that, wow, so this is how they do it. If they decide they want your house, they take it. You know what I mean? If, if they decide that the people who are living on this land, and these people are peaceful people, and they want the land, then you do as Sherman, General Sherman did in Colorado. You send your soldiers, this is after the Civil War, you send your soldiers to Colorado and you have them to poison and kill a million buffalo to starve the Native Americans out of existence. Right. If, you, if you have the will, you do as the Germans did in Namibia. If you want the land of the people, you kill 50,000 in one day. To control people. You do as the French did in Cherry, the Cherry 44 in Dakar City, where you bring the military people together and you massacre them. You kill them all. You know what Carl Peters did in Germany, in West, in West Africa, the German in West Africa? I just want to remind y'all, because you know what? Even though we are historical people, we, we're very forgetful. So, you know, black people, we are like that. It's not, I mean, but, but it's hard because, you know, we don't have the institutions that continue to bring our information out front, so we don't know. That's why this, why this conference and celebration is so beautiful. You can walk and see all this beautiful stuff and yeah. new, new information. I love it. And we should always recognize Eric Stafford for this because it's a powerful thing to bring all this information out and, and, and because we don't know it. Carl Peters, one German. One German basically subdued the major ethnic groups 
of what is now Tanzania. One drum with a pistol. You know what he did? He would go from village to village. He said, who is the chief? And they would show him, and he'd take his pistol and shoot him. And, and what would his bodyguards do? They would rise up with their spears, and he would shoot them all. Go to another village. Who is the chief? They show you who the chief is. He shoot him. Eventually, what he had done, he had subdued the whole, all the people. He passed by that time. There's nothing you can do. The man got it done. He'll shoot you. Just one drum, Carl Peters. That's his name. And so everything comes out of this will that Europe has had to, to kill people, destroy people. To, to mess with people. That, that's, and, this, and we, with our spiritual nature, with our sense of fairness, we, we have not yet developed a counter to it that will keep us human. You know, that's the deep challenge that we have. Well, when we saw the Europeans come, as Kwame Atsa did in Ghana in 1482. He says, come, we will, we greet you with open arms. We bear no weapons. You know, white people wrote, the natives are like children. They misunderstood the nature of hospitality. They misunderstood, or they did understand, that by virtue of our sense of relationship and our spiritual connection, we were willing to share with other people. And they decided that that was weakness. This is what they did to the Native Americans. Why do you think y'all have Thanksgiving? Right. All y'all go celebrate Thanksgiving. That's because the Europeans felt that the Native people who saved them during the bitter winters that these native people, they gave us food and gave us shelter. Then they went and they had massacres of native people. Killed them. There are many in this history. I've written this history. Yes, yes. It's a terrible thing that they did. And we, and we are, I mean, you know, let me just tell you something too. I mean, please, just give me, bear with me, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm of the age now. Dr. God Walter, that I can just ask for permission to just say, to just say, you know, when you when you get my age, you can just, you know, bear with it. You know, we we African people with this great history and this great culture, we must be more attentive to each other, to our children, to our community and to the future of our people. We have to do this. We, there's nobody going to do it for you. I'm telling you, it, that, that's exactly why the uh, Molecular Kente Asante Institute was established. Because I knew, and my wife knew, we said nobody will do this but us. Who, who will do it for us? I, I'm not waiting for no white folk to come and do it for us. They ain't going to do that. You think they want an institute that will see our survival? Do they want to see our children survive? Look, black people, know, just, take, just take the educate. Black people know how to educate their children. I, I, I know what's wrong with education. But you think they will allow you to educate your children? No, that's not about to happen. I'm telling you, you we're the only people. And, and Malcolm said it. We, we are the only people who believe that our enemies will educate our children properly. They will come out and they will love us. Our children will come out of school and they will love us. No, when our children come out of those institutions, they often come out with negative attitudes about black people. How can I tell you this? Because I have them in my class at Temple. Black students in my class who are more reactionary and conservative than white students.
talking about, well, Barack Obama's just campaigning. Well, white people campaigning too. You know, what, what's wrong with them campaigning? You know, you have this negative, I mean this negative thing. Now let me tell you this, I want to say this too. And I hope, I don't, I don't, I'm glad this is not a, a, one of these places where we have to worry about your political statements, right? That's good. I like that. You know, I, that's why we have to create our own space on German time. Because we say, we want to be able to say what we want to say. And I know they play videotape, but it's all right. Dude. This is okay. But I think this is, even though I have some issues with some of the political policies of this administration, I have had issues with a whole lot of administrations before. <laughs> so so that's, that's the other thing. I still believe that Barack Obama is the best choice for our people. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm telling you this, I'm telling you this because, because, and I need to tell you this, because I have good friends, close friends, friends that I debate with and discuss with, who, do, who don't take that position. And I ask them, and it's logical for some, the way some of them think, not to take it. But my position is this, that in America, you have normally two choices. If you ain't gonna go with the Republican, who you gonna go with? <laughs> now you can say I ain't going with none of them. You can say that. But I, I am not going to reduce my choices to that. But my, my position on this is, that I have a problem, I tell you what some of the problems I have. I have a problem with the bombing of Libya. Yes, I have a problem with that. I, I have a problem with the treatment of Haiti. I have a problem with the treatment of Haiti. I still have a problem with the treatment of Haiti. I have a problem right now that the, the uh, Obama administration is, some people in that administration are still trying to figure out how to bring Aristide to trial. Do you know that? Y'all never heard that, but I heard that. I know that for, for a fact. So I have a problem with what they have been trying to do to Zimbabwe, to kill Zimbabwe with sanctions. I have a problem with the administration of that. And, and, and I have a problem with the fact that uh, the administration uh, not only uh, sanctioned the killing of Gaddafi, but unleashed in the Arab world the most reactionary racist as rebels that we have ever seen in, in Northern Africa. It's, I have a problem with what, is, what has happened. You see what I'm saying? But taking all of that, if I look back at the Bush administration, <laughs> holy, holy, <laughs> oh, Obama is a better choice. <laughs> No, that, that's the only way. You gotta look at, you gotta win. We won't get everything we want. Because I want it all, but you can't get that. And this is a discussion I have with my colleague, uh, Cornell West. I have this, because we have to have that discussion. That, that yes, we, we know that there are certain things, certain achievements that we can look for, but we also know the opposition in this country. We understand clearly the Republican opposition and the racist opposition. Do you know that President Obama has received more death threats than all the other presidents put together? Do you understand what he's up against? The pressure that he, that's on this man? No, you can't. You have to be clear. African people have to be clear. African American people have to understand American society. There are people who have become more racist since Obama has become president. I'm not going to, I don't even have time to tell you all the things that happened to me at Temple. So I'm not going to even go into that. But that's a whole other story. The story of the attempt to destroy Africana studies, to destroy Afri African studies, African American studies, Pan African studies, to wipe it out. Now this is this is the only because we are post racial. Uh, we are more racist. This is the racist era. 
Look at this. In 1850, there was a fugitive slave law. And that fugitive slave law said that any African who left the South and went to the North, to Pennsylvania, Ohio, could be captured and taken back to slavery. That you couldn't have freedom just because you went to a free area of the United States. They said that this law had to be enforced. And in the law, it said that if a white person in the North who was a sheriff or a constable did not support the law, he could be fined $1,000. In other words, if a white southerner came up to capture me in Philadelphia, and the sheriff here in Philadelphia did not help him capture me, the sheriff would have to pay $1,000. That was how they got everybody to be in the South. Even the Northern whites were in the South at that point. At that point, black people decided to go to Canada. This is why Canada became important to us. We went to Ontario. We said, even Harry Tumble, we said we were across the, we're going to get out of here, we got to get out of here. Because they may try to capture us and take us back into slavery. So if we don't have any protection, let's get out of here. And then in Pittsburgh, in 18, the, the, the uh, president was Miller Fillmore. In uh, 1850, they had a big rally in Pittsburgh, right here in the state of Pennsylvania. And the mayor asked Martin Delaney, one of my heroes, if he would come and if he would speak on behalf of the black community. Now, I don't know whether you've ever heard of Martin Delaney. All right, good. I love that. This is good. I love talking to my people. Well, that's beautiful. You guys, y'all right with me. I love that because I, but our children must know. Now, remember that. Our children must know Martin Delaney. He was a physician. He, he served even in the Civil War later. He was, a, he was an amazing human being. We have, we've had so many amazing human beings. And Martin Delaney was asked to speak. And so he went to the rally. And in fact, he's been called the first black nationalist. And I'm telling you why he's a black nationalist. That's the tradition I'm in. He said, uh, they said, uh, speak. And Delaney got up and he said, honorable mayor, Whatever ideas I have about liberty, I have learned from reading your revolutionary fathers. And one of those ideas is that a person has the right to defend his castle with his life even to the taking of life. Sir, my home is my castle. And in it dwell none but my wife and my children as free as the angels in heaven and as sacred as the pillars of God. Sir, if any man shall come to that house in search of a slave, be he constable, be he sheriff, be he judge of the Supreme Court, no. Let it be him who sanctioned this act into law, President Miller Fillmore himself, with his cabinet as his bodyguard, and with the Declaration of Independence dangling over his head as his banner, 
and the constitution of his country on his breast as his shield. If he crosses the threshold of my door in search of a slave, and I do not lay him a lifeless corpse at my feet, may the grave refuse my body a resting place. And may heaven refuse my spirit over. No, he cannot enter this house. And we both live. Well, that's why you haven't heard of Martin Lane. <laughs> you don't read about him in the textbooks, do you? They don't write that. Hey, that's not a speech you find in the textbook. Famous speeches in America. One of the greatest speeches ever given because it stated precisely how black people felt. Their freedom, freedom was so dear to them. And this speech to me is as great as Patrick Henry's speech, give me liberty or give me death. Renaissance comes when we, as African people, are able to take our history and our culture and wrap it around us, not in an arrogant fashion, but in a sense of heritage and a sense of culture and a sense of feeling how beautiful it is to just be yourself. Look, you know what? You don't have to hate anybody to do this. And I have to say that, before we didn't even have to say that, but now we have to say that, because I'm like, say, well, you know he's talking about loving white people, that means hate white people. I didn't say that. No, don't go for I tell people, I'm saying hate white people. No, I didn't, the son didn't say that. I said you've got to love yourself. You've got to have a sense of your own history and culture. You can't talk uh, on an equal basis with somebody if you don't know who you are. You, you, can't, you can't share with somebody unless you have something to share. I mean, we sit on the same, around the same table and everybody's sharing, and then when it comes your time, you share whiteness too. Like, you, like that's yours. You know what? I mean, we do that because we don't have anything. We think we don't have anything, but we, we, don't, we don't know. We don't investigate. We don't, we don't know how to love our own culture. I love it every day. I wake up every morning. That's the only thing I think about. How I think about everything. That's, I, I, I have a shrine to my ancestors. And that shrine to my ancestors has my father, my grandfather, my mother, my grandmother. Oh, that's my inspiration. What would they say? What would they want us to do? What would they want me to do? What, how do they want me to live and be? Stone in the road, we try. Bitter the chastening rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to the place for which our parents we have come all the way, but with tears have been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter, out of the gloomy past, till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. Thank you.